And on the way home, I noticed this massive sign on the side of the road that said, Fresh Lobster. It's like, oh yeah, nice. So I wouldn't normally treat myself to fresh lobster, but it was my little brother's birthday, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to stop in and give him a treat? Yeah, the tea man, he loves the lobster. <laughs> so I pull over the side of the road, and I jump out, and I say to the guy um, behind the counter, I say, g'day mate, give us the biggest lobster you've got at the back there. Because my little brother's six foot seven, and he does eat a lot of lobster meat. So the guy goes out the back, and two minutes later, he comes from nowhere with this massive brown paper bag wrapped lobster. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to call Larry. So, so I chuck Larry in the front of the car with me in, and we hoon down the highway home, and I get home to my inner city flat, St Kilda, in the Bronx, and I go, I go put Larry in the fridge. I'm like, oh, wow, so massive, it doesn't fit in the fridge. Oh, yeah, I know. I'll just let him chill out in the bath until I'm ready for the, for the pate. So I go in the bathroom, and as I'm leaning over the bath, the strangest thing happened. The paper bag started rustling and, 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 and moving and unraveling. And next thing you know, the lobster came alive. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that said fresh lobster, not live lobster. I mean, I didn't grow up on a farm, I'm not a fisherman. I've got no idea how to kill a lobster. And I think I'm morally opposed to it. <laughs> so what do I do? I back off the bus. And I go and put myself in full-blown combat gear. I'm like, lies, you're bigger than the lobster. Get back in there, mate. You can get it. Catch it. So I crack back in there. <laughs> I had a red hot go. Can't say I didn't try. There's no way, no one's gonna catch a lobster and kill you, kidding me? So I did what any self-respecting person in my generation would do. And I grabbed out my iPhone, <laughs> took a couple of forensic shots, like, yeah. And I backed out again and I whacked them up on Facebook. <laughs> uh, I'm like, come on, mate, there's got, there's got to be someone that can help me now. But so, heaps of mates. I'm massive on Twitter. So hey, I've got a couple of friends. I need help. <laughs> well, you know, the only person I know who's a fisherman lives 5,000 k's away up in FNQ, far north Queensland. So lucky for me, I've got video Skype. <laughs> so I grab my laptop and I back back in the bathroom. I'm like, mate, I've got a code red. How do I catch this thing? Kiwi? It's like, well, there's no worries, mate. You can catch it. Just, just grab it with the tongs and whack it in the freezer. Like, Oh, that's a negative gross writer. I've tried that. That's not going to happen. So then, oh, I'm like, so then I whack back on my Facebook wall and some of my mates have said, lies, you can whack it in a pot of boiling water till it squeals. Like, who are these people? <laughs> Someone else has said, yes, yeah, stab it in the head with a steely knife. Not in my bathroom, not in my kitchen. So of course, I have to broaden my search. How do I really it? It's very important to me. I'm going to sleep at night. So I broaden my search, and you know, there's a lot of academic debate around how you actually humanely kill a lobster. You know, it doesn't have a primitive nervous system, it doesn't feel pain. That doesn't sound right. Oh, it's not that nasty. Has it got a peanut brain and it can't think or feel emotion? Well, apparently, also, you can sedate it in clove oil and also kill it with vodka. <laughs> Well, I did think about that, but I thought, buddy, on the lobby. I mean, that wasn't gonna happen. So you know what, I'm like, I'm gonna a fix. I better broaden my search. So it wasn't until I broadened my search into the blogosphere that I met this amazing grandpa called Bob. And, and Bob had, had a blog in Maine, you know, so that's him with his son, Matt. And he, you know, he, he taught me how to humanely kill a lobster, that you can actually fill the bath with fresh water. Yes, I can. And yes, that's so nice. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. So I get back in the bathroom and I maneuver myself with the tongs and the combat gear and put the plug in and fill the bath with water. Oh, and I wait. Yes, I've seen that scene in Fatal Attraction, the bath scene. <laughs> My leg clothes coming back to life. <laughs> anyway, well. That actually didn't happen. Larry humanely died. So I updated my Facebook wall, RIP Larry. That was, look, you know, it was a bit of a sad time. We had bonded. 
So I took him out of the bath and, and then took him to the kitchen and I managed to chop his head off and slice it open and boil it and freeze it just in case. But that thing was massive. <laughs> so anyway, then the next day I take it down to my brother, look to him for his birthday, I'm like, happy birthday, mate. <laughs> so alive, thanks. Frozen lobster, Woo, sweet. He goes, you know you can buy them fresh down the coast. <laughs> Brothers. You know, I get shocked just about every single day of my life when people stop me in the street and they say to me, Lies, when do you find the time to use social media? Are you kidding me? My life depends upon it. You know, obviously I'm not here to talk to you about lobsters today. What I'm here to talk to you about is the biggest innovation in media that's happened in the last 400 years. And that innovation, ladies and gentlemen, is you and I as the social inclusion into the mass media equation. Now, when I grew up, watching TV was like having a part-time job. <laughs> and if there's anyone in the audience here under 20, you would not understand the intensity of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but no one ever said to me back then, lies, when do you find the time to watch TV? Oh, no, well, you know what? That's socially acceptable. It's, it, you know, it's seen as a very, very eloquent way to waste all of your spare time. Yeah, we know TV, we know, yeah, we do it for 50 years, <laughs> that's right. But um, look, is there anyone in the room here? Raise your hands. Anyone over 40? Over, over 50? Over 60? Well, <laughs> people of your generation <laughs> love it, believe it or not, <laughs> have invested up to 50,000 hours on average watching TV. Epic work. <laughs> 50,000 hours. Imagine unlocking that. And when I say consuming TV, I say when we watch TV, we know it and we love it with the TV dinners. You sit down and you passively consume professionally produced content, which is not always that good, by the way. Now, can you imagine what's happening today in today's society? It's a seismic shift. We're shifting towards every single passive consumer of professionally produced information is now also an active producer. This is unlocking 50,000 hours of talent. That means that, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in the room here, you and I, we, we are the directors, the producers, the actors in our very own show. Just like I was shocked that Larry the Lobster came alive. It wasn't pretty. So too are most of the people in this economy shocked that media is now alive. And, and yes, it's unwieldy, and yes, it's hard to catch and to manage, and yes, you don't want it running through your house unchecked. And yes, we've got to learn a whole new skill set to catch it, to contain it, to maybe consume it. But when we do that, it tastes so good. It tastes so sweet. You know, it's a fact that we humans find the time to do the things that we love. I mean, where do these guys find the time? You know? Where do you find the time to fall in love? Where does Warren from Geelong, oh, cats, find the time to get up? Where, where does this happen before the cat? How does he find the time? Strange. You know, I want to talk about how the past 10 years have shown us, given the right motive and opportunity, very same human beings will start doing crazy new things. So I want to do another survey of the audience. Put your hand up. Anyone here that has sat on a toilet somewhere in Melbourne this week and got their iPhone out and checked their Facebook, Facebook status? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, how many people have walked into a bar with their best mates but they still don't tell everyone else? Yeah. That's it. Strange. Talking to people, socialising on the toilet. Wow. <laughs> now, what, when we look at the internet, and this is a shout out to Steve Jobs, rest in peace, but it is a massive opportunity machine. And no one in this room is debating that. Like, it's, you'd be mad if you did. The evidence is there. We have ubiquitous broadband. The price of computing is commoditised. So the evidence is there. What is shocking, um, our economy, it's the social usage of this technology. The people are actually using it for social reasons. Why would they do that? That's, uh, that's baffling, that's crazy. 
And why? Because, because we're human. Because, because we love to be loved, to give love, to share love, to be part of something bigger than ourselves, to be belong, to share ideas, wisdom and knowledge, you know. Humans have always wanted to help each other. We're hardwired that way, social creatures. But this is the first time in history it's having a major economic impact. So can you imagine just about every single waking person in the Western world having access to supercomputing capabilities, normally within a one metre radius of themselves, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Imagine what that does to our ability to communicate to each other, to organise our social life, our love life. Imagine what that does to the way we communicate with our customers. That's extraordinary. You know, it's like we're all in this massive, global experiment in real time right now. No one knows what's going on. We're all in this experiment of human-to-human -human communications. We're recreating it as quickly as it happens. And it's still really, really early days. It's never too late to get involved. But when we're all part of the mania and confusion of injecting two billion content creators into our economy, I mean, that is really shocking. It is really surprising. It is disrupting traditional economics. But then again, all revolutions are surprising and shocking and disrupting. Otherwise, they wouldn't be revolutions. You know, I think the question is not today. Do we as individuals have the power to a massive impact on, the, on a mass media scale? That's not the question. I think really the question is how we're going to choose to use this power as human beings to co-create the future that we have imagined. You know, the wonderful play of life goes on. Fact is stranger than fiction. Let's we all get out there, have a go, get amongst it, and contribute your own wacky verse. One lobster at a time. Thank you. Thank you.